What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and it's great to reconnect with Kevin Brandino Brandon. Brandino is a nine-time Grammy Award-winning bassist, producer, composer, and arranger, and he's also an Eastman artist. I have worked for Eastman for several years on the bass side of things, and I had Brandino back on the podcast in 2016. I can't believe it's been five years. So today we're catching up with Brandino about what has been going on in his life ever since that. He had some health issues not too long after that interview, but he is back. We talk about five string basses. He plays several Eastman five string basses. Get into all of that and more. You can check out the description below for more information. Let's dive into it. You get a five string bass. Well, why do you get it? Well, you get it to play low notes, mm -hmm. to utilize the low end. The, if you don't, then you just get a, either a regular four string or you get a four string with a, uh, an extension on it. I mean, there's no sense of having a five string unless you're going to utilize the low register for something, whatever it is. And it opens up so many possibilities. You know, I'm, you can see my four string with the extension in the back there. But, you know, when you get a five and, and that's sort of that's something that you've done your whole, you know, for, for a long time now at this point, the, the, you know, embrace the five string and, you know, five strings can get a reputation as having like a dead sound sometimes if they're not set up right. But that hasn't been the case with the bases of yours that I've heard and played, I mean, you managed to get, get a setup that's nice and open and I'm sure it's strings and then just set yeah. up in general. And then of course the way that you play, but you know, you start, I think back to playing some orchestra passages, you know, Beethoven symphonies and such trying to get around that extension. Some of the stuff you just can't do on an extension. Well, it's you know, uh, I was fortunate to whenever I met Ruben back in the day at the NAMP show and he was laughing but you know, I you know I I work with Benjamin Wright, the the great arranger Benjamin Wright that's done you know uh, all the hits for uh, 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 what's uh, uh, with Verdine White's uh, Earth Wind and Fire, mm -hmm. you know uh, Justin Timberlake, um, uh, 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 what, what Rihanna, Usher, uh, you know the list goes on. When I got off the road originally, he called me, do I, you know, I, I, was I classically trained? And I started doing his dates. He was writing parts like for an, a five string electric bass. So I told him I was gonna go find a company that I could commission uh, to build me bass, which was Eastman, because I couldn't really find anything in town. And the stuff that I had found was really garbage. It was just, you know, it was garbage. I go, man, you want me to pay 20 grand for that? The bass doesn't even sound. So the late John Peterson, that was the godfather here in town, I got with him. We went on on my on my bases, we went through four different manufacturers of strings. Wow. To find out which one would actually bring the instrument in. And John had passed away this year. So Ralph Acala, which is the the young a Luther, the only Luther we have in LA, which I've known from World of Strings before it closed, which now he's at Eastman, would you know that? Mm -hmm. Ralphie took over where John, you know, once John passed. So the bottom line is um, the whole thing with five string is be able to get it so that you don't have a lot of tension on the instrument, especially with the bow, but at the same time that the B string is not too loose so that it's so flabby that it takes forever to pull it. So there's a fine, there's really a fine match and issue uh, going between uh, the low string and the high strings to get it so that the, the tension across the bass is pretty even. But especially when you go to that low string that you don't, you're not fighting with it. Mm -hmm. So what I found out because uh, one of my good friends, Dominic Genova, he had a Grunart, which I had bought a four string uh, with an extension, but he had a five string Grunart that he had got from Ohio Symphony, one of the symphonies 20 years ago. So we started talking and I brought him down to Eastman originally with me. We took a trip down and met Ruben and saw what they had. So I don't want to really claim it, but it's funny because there's about four other bass players now that are younger than me playing five strings. So I'm not going to disregard <laughs> Dominic because Dominic's been doing TV and movie for years doing that bass. But as far as I'm, I'm claiming for commercial music records, 
that I'm the one that started that in this town, which I already know I have. And it's on records. It's on records. And one of the Kelly was asking me this morning, do you did did you do that LA string song called LA song or something on a Ty Dollar sign? I said, Yeah, I did the original date because I know him and my his father, Tyrone, the trumpet player. We did we did dates at Death Row Records, you know, back in the day with Suge Knight and all that. So he said, man, that's a great. I said, Benjamin Wright's a great arranger. He said, so you played on that? I said, yeah, I played on the whole album. Whatever there's strings, it's me. And it's the same thing with Well I Am, you know, and the list goes on. So I've kind of patterned myself only because originally, um, back in the day, I claimed that I'm the first one bass player that ever made the first six string bass electric. And there's a thing about Anthony Jackson. And I said, okay, I met Anthony when I joined Aretha and, and played uh, Carnegie Hall in 81, met up with him, showed him my bass. He goes, somebody's building one. I said, yeah, but you're seeing one in front of you. So that means that I trumped you. And I'm not telling because he's a great player, man. You know, no. You know, Anthony Jackson, uh, he's a bad dude. Yeah. But the claim I was trying to do because People told me at the NAMM show back then, well, you're crazy. Are you on drugs? I said, no, I've been playing an electric bass since I was nine years old. I said, I'm sick of that. I need a range. I need a bigger range. You know, so I contracted a couple of friends of mine, uh, uh, Kenny Climack and uh, Cooney, that owns performance guitars uh, here in L.A., contracted them years ago, early 70s, mid 70s. So we started working on that approach. So anyway, that's what's up that, you know, so when I called Guitar Bass Player Magazine, which there was no Bass Player Magazine, it was Guitar Player Magazine that was doing both. They said, well, you're crazy and it's Anthony Jackson. I go, well, they're not going to give a poor little kid, a little railroad track baby from South Central, any claim to a big New York session player. But I had mine beforehand. And Jimmy Johnson can testify to that because he turned me on the GHS that made prototype strings for me. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, so I've been doing this a long time. But anyway, getting back to the five strings so we can talk about Eastman, our company. <laughs> so that's kind of what's up with that. And um, I remember taking my Grunart with the extension, beautiful bass. I took it to a hip-hop session with Well I Am, and it, was, and it ended up being a triple date. And... I was having problems because I wanted low D's, low C sharps. And with that extension, I said, I'll never go on a pop date, on an Arco date with an, with an extension on a four string. It ain't going to happen. I mean, I mean, I really struggled with that, trying to reinvent how am I going to do this? I'm going to leave this open so when I have to play E, I'm going to have to finger it because the stop is already open on the D flat and stuff like that. It was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And, you know, so I'm seeing people with five string basses. I said, I wonder who was playing that first before you got one. They usually don't say anything, but that's all good. I already know because obviously we were talking about that somewhat in the interview that we did five, six years ago or whatever. And I, and I, and I think I started working with Ben consistently either 2008 or 10 or whatever. I've worked with him before, but since I've been in town, I get calls because I'm not on the road. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's either here nor there. It happens when it happens. Well, you know? on, a, on a recording date too, you know, it's funny because you think about extensions, if you're just playing in a symphony section or something, there might be just little inconsistencies or sounds or like what you're talking about, like leaving the E open or not. You might not think about it so much, but if, if you're on the mic and you're doing a record date for Will I Am or something like that, all of a sudden, all those things are like, is the extension really in tune exactly? Like how, like, what are you going to, you know, and, and yeah. it's, it's incredible how fussy they get. Like I have a great extension. It's been set up by really good people, but I have to be so careful to not get any buzzing or rattling or anything like that and that's the sort of stuff that just can't it's got to be it can't, it's not going to fly in a, in a record date i'll bet well yeah it's one of the guys that one of the one of the brothers that i know here that does movie stuff we were talking last night and he bought a five string and he said well you know i really i gotta mention name but he says man the first time i took it out i really had to figure out about going across the strings and really did that because it was so much different than a four string 
And he said, well, I learned my lesson that I really had to get that down. And I was laughing. I said, I already been there, done it. Because the bottom line, usually with a four string, you have a certain amount of arch. You really can't get a bit as that much of an arch or basically your A and D string are, are just too hard to play. I mean, you try to go up in thumb position or do a chromatic on the string and get up to thumb position. You really can't push that octave down with your third finger. I mean, it has to be that high basically for the bow. So it really, you have to really choose or know when you're crossing strings because it's really hard to get that kind of curvature for five strings when everybody's used to setting up either for jazz or orchestra playing the contour of the bridge. Yeah. Which me and Ralphie have talked about. That really becomes our, that's why I have two instruments, one set up for Arco and one for Pitts. So I don't have to go through that. Yeah, it's tricky for the bow, and and that's the thing is most people are used to setting up a four string, right? So they haven't right. had it as much. I remember playing. Uh, there's a great bassist in the Lyric Opera of Chicago who's who only plays on five strings, and he has the set. I mean, the 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 curvature on the bridge works well for him for arco, but it's like probably it would be really annoying for pizzicato if you were playing mostly pizzicato lines. So I get why right. you'd want the two setups. Um, but yeah. That, I, I've really enjoyed. I mean, the 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 two five strings of yours that I've seen have, are really free and open, and they seem to the setup seems great on them. Well, that's because I think I bought them in two thousand ten or eleven. Professor Harvey bought one too, and he goes, "Our bass is about ten years old." And the ones that I have, the, or the ones that I've seen recently at the show, what two years ago. They're, they're different. They're definitely built. And I don't even know if they're as good as the ones that me and Harvey bought 10 years ago. They might be overbuilt. I'm not really sure, you know, because I haven't been out to the factory for years, obviously. But um, I think we got some of the prime stuff really at a good price. And, um, you know, I don't know where they're made because you you know better than I do. But both of them are, are different instruments. And the one I have set up for jazz bass, uh, Professor Harvey really likes it. It's a thinner neck. It, you know, it's really easy to get around, but it has a really great sound. And my engineer have told me both of them uh, have been they're built differently and the way they're shaped. Mm -hmm. and, and the tops are different. You know, all that. So I just looked out. So the one that I sent you the other day was the... Uh, I call it the Justin Timberlake one. And uh, my engineer likes that one better because it's more focused. Because the one, the other one that I have, um, I've been told by uh, uh, the concert master, right? Which is the violinist, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, I'm just making sure, you know, from a classical point of view. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, um, I haven't lost all my information. So uh, one of my concert masters had told me on a date, one day I brought one bass in, one the other day. He goes, man, that other bass, I like that one better. I said, why? He said, that other one that you bring in, hey, I can hear it going into my microphone. It takes over the whole, it takes over the whole orchestra. And it spreads that big. The spread on that one's so big. My engineer told me that. So, you know, uh, that's my jazz bass. And usually if I'm doing that, I'm just doing a record anyway. So I don't have to worry about it messing with strings. You know, they're just getting the pits on it. And it's big and it's big and round. And it's funny because a guy, had, I went to one studio for an artist. And the engineer comes and says, man, I've never heard a bass sound that good. I said, well, you never. I said, I don't want to brag, but you never heard me. But you never heard a five-string bass like this. Because there's only one like this in L.A. Sorry. You know. And... Mm -hmm. I was told by one of the younger gentlemen coming up that the Berlin Symphony, that's all they do is play five string. So, you know, the next time if I ever go back to Germany for Warwick or whatever, you know, I, I would love to go to whatever, uh, Munich, Mittenwald or wherever those things and just see how they, what their approach. Because I've been told that basically the Berlin Symphony, there's eight bass players that came to the, you know, a, what a Kodak Center, I guess a couple of years ago. And it was all, it was eight bass players with eight five string bass. So I, you know, I, I missed the concert, 
but I would be able to love to talk to somebody if they could talk English and just get kind of because that's where it comes from. So that's yeah. why I got it. So it made it a lot easier on, on a Benjamin Wright's dates that if I had to do a low string or something or do a divisi with a, my stand partner, we had double. We had the rich note and something below, you know, which I call booty bass. So that it has that if they need it, fine. If they don't, then, you know, they don't have to use it. But, you know, I've done that on a lot of dates, you know, and usually on, on Will I Am with uh, the, uh, the arranger conductor on Ray Gill, you know, usually I'll ask him. And then he'll just tell me, yeah, drop it down. You know, so then we don't have to worry about it. It's right there. D's right there. Mm -hmm. You know, either open string or you're fingering it on your, you know, on your a second string, on the A string, the D, and I'm dropping down, you know, and, and it's like it's in two. Mm -hmm. It's like playing a five string electric, except it's real big. Yeah. <laughs> real big. That one's real big. It's a big bass. It's really too big for me, but hey. What can I say? Sometimes beggars can be choosers. <laughs> well, you make it work. I mean, I, I always remember uh, that, at that Roboth Institute a couple of years ago, you did something really, you, really one, one moment I remember that was really cool is you brought, you brought some, char I, 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 it was either from Will I Am or maybe Justin Timberlake, and you were just like talking to the kids there about how, how, you, how the baseline got built and you were like playing what you did and just kind of talking about the whole process. It was really interesting to like, and interesting for me, but really interesting for them too, I'm sure, to kind of like get a look inside what a session on a on a major song like that is like right right yeah well you know most you know my my teacher Nat Gangersi was was the godfather in his town going back probably from the 40s and 50s when he moved from Chicago to LA doing silent films with Red Calendar you know he told me 90 percent of the stuff you play will be whole notes mm-hmm and he says, the other 10% will be stuff that you'll never be able to play, so don't worry about it. Because it'll just be stuff that really isn't meant for the bass. It's probably meant more for the cello. And there's been times that they said, well, can you play this line, a cello line, or whatever. And then you start dealing with thumb position and crossing over the strings or whatever, which a lot of people don't really have really worked on that. But the thing about when we did the Rabath, I brought my cello bass. Yep. which has a high C string on it with a low E. And you heard it. I just heard it, that bass sounds great. Yeah. I don't know what model is of Eastman. It's all wood bass, but that thing from day one, it didn't have to break it in. It was great. And the thing I had noticed that I had told the kids, when I'm preparing for it, when I was going up high, I was losing space because I had my three fingers here and doing this between the two notes like this, I was over already overshooting <laughs> because it was almost like a violin that you had to use one finger to go up and down and, you know, go a half step up because if I did it with my fingers, I'd be, I'd be sharp. And I didn't even notice that until I had prepared that piece. Wow. You know, but um, I love Eastman. They're affordable. They sound great. I had some slack from some of my colleagues saying, well, you're playing Chinese basses instead of German. And I said, well, why don't you buy me one of those basses since you make all the money? Why don't you buy me all the basses then maybe I'll play that one, the one you bought me. But from an economical point of view, I told them this is what's up, especially after the pandemic. You know, money's tight, blah, blah, blah. And I said, when I go into a session, I usually know the engineer, it's usually the same one. And I usually ask the engineer how the bass sounds. And they said, the bass sounds great. And I said, well, they don't come out like if I'm in a symphony orchestra, ask me what brand, where's the label inside, do you have a flashlight so we can look at it? All that patina stuff that goes in the classical world that you know about. They don't ask, all they ask is if the bass sounds good or not. And the bass sounds good and that's all they care about. Yeah. Well, so it's, it's not a big it's not a big thing. I'm not the first violinist saying that I have a Stradivarius. You know, it's not that kind of scenario. Yeah. So realistically, most people don't know anyway. You know, some engineers come up. 
Hey man, where's the plug? <laughs> they did that when I did Andre, when I did Outcast. We were talking about Outcast because they said some new stuff came out, and I was talking to Arabian Prince that's got a lot of Grammys from NWA. He goes, Hey man, no, they're doing this now. You need to find out about that. They've, you know, and I said, Well, I don't, I haven't followed that. I'm just getting back on track now. And was saying that, but you know, the bottom line when I did Well I Am. I was at, I don't know, Larrabee. I was, at, what is it, Larrabee? I think I was Larrabee North and Larrabee South. Whatever. The one in West LA is the original one. I think it was Larrabee. I'm sh- not really sure. So anyway, I talked to the lead. I said, well, let me talk to the lead engineer. So they called in. I said, well, I need a couple of annoyments. I need U87s matched. Well, we don't have none. Well, you need to go get one. You're Larrabee. You don't have a U87? Come on. So I said, are you the head engineer? He goes, yeah. He said, well, where's the plug? I said, Sorry, sir. I'm playing Arco. There's not an output jack like an electric bass. And you're telling me that you're the lead engineer? Have you ever recorded an acoustic bass? So he's kind of looking at me. So well, it's going to take you a couple hours. I said, I'm on the clock. So I'm getting paid. You know, you need to give me two mics. I said, because, uh, man, I'm thinking, I'm, what's the guy's name? That run that ran that uh, the guy. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about the guy's name. I'm a well known engineer here that had two studios, and now he has plugins from his famous studio in Hollywood that he had for years. When I recorded Bobby Lyle's first album for Atlantic that hit a number one chart, um, I was in Hollywood. And he told me how to mic for pizzicato acoustic bass. And he goes, the bottom line, you have matched mics. Mm. The same mic, put it on both sides, off the side of the bridge. And, and you put them, you, you pan them hard left and right. So you don't have a panning a, a problem. Because if you had them both here, they cancel each other out. Right. So you do a half. Phase. Yeah, you yeah. go, yeah, it's out of phase. So he says you go hard left and hard right. So when you do it, now you can put both of them in the middle, bring up the faders, and get the sound that you want out of the instrument that you need in the mix. You know, so he came back, and then we did this record. You know, and I remember I started at midnight, and I, I was walking out at 8 o'clock. So I was telling one of the guys this morning at lunch, that's golden time. And I was the, I was the contractor because I'm the only one there in the union and I'm the bass player. And I did four, I did four overdub parts on four different songs. So I told Andre 3000, I said, well, because I'm here and blah, blah, blah. Let me see like you have a bass orchestra underneath you. So I double tracked four times, you know. So he went for it and all that. And, and I think two of the songs or three of the songs, it made the album, I have no idea. And I was telling them that uh, that when I brought the uni contract in, the lady that wasn't there that long with contracts was yelling at me because she said, well, people like you, you give the uni musicians a bad rep. And I said, well, wait a minute. I've been doing this for a long time. I don't even know who you are. And I said, I worked my ass off, excuse my French. And I just came back from burying one of my, my relatives the day before. And I'm starting at midnight and I'm going straight through eight o'clock and I'm doing four songs that I had to write charts for and write the whole thing to know what, what how the track went and what key it was in, you know? So, and then we had me and Andre, I said, sing the parts. So he's saying the parts he wanted me to do. So I, then I did that. So, I mean, there was a lot of work involved. Now I'm arranging and writing bass parts and all that stuff. So, man, give me a break. The money I charged was not really to what it was. You know, because if I got credit on it as a writer writing the bass part, you know, I would have been a millionaire right now. Mm-hmm. Seriously. Because mm-hmm. I told, I was telling Kelly in Arabian, it sold 18 million units at $20 per unit. Wow. So you add it up. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So my six or 10 grand I made ain't nothing compared to 18 million times $20.
Thank you. <laughs> I remember you talking about 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 the, the kind of the whole business music thing with the kids at the Raboth Institute. And it was really interesting because people people don't realize what goes into the business. You know, like the business of music. There's so much that you know. You start start out playing, and you're playing your scales, and you're playing your pieces, and you realize, but there's just there's so much involved. Like just that that story right there kind of shows you like all the all the levels that you have to think about as an artist. Well, I might have went over their head because I know there was a lot of young kids. Well, but but, the, that, but there were some teenagers too. No, I think. Oh, it's good. Really, I think it's really interesting yeah. for the for the. Well, the, that the good thing is that once you get through all the normal stuff on your instrument, it's all about business mm -hmm. because it's how you conduct, how you look. It's all that. It becomes. A, it's a business scenario, and I tell people sometimes you don't get the call or sometimes you don't get the gig. It has nothing to do with your playing. If they're looking for a certain look. And blah blah blah, and that's just how it is. It's a business of music, mm -hmm. so it's a business, and they got who's ever putting out the money or showing the money. They need to get a return on their money. So don't worry about if you didn't get it because it might not have nothing to do playing wise. It might have to do visually or whatever. They're trying to get, you know, a a, a money making venture that they're making money back on, and what they need you for might not be what you think they you need. They need you what they need you for, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, even on like a, a, some of the new shows, they say, if you're over 30, we can't hire you. And that's coming from a producer and a director. So realistically by law, that's really against the law because that's discrimination. But you know, people will need to work. So what is somebody gonna do a lawsuit? I'm 50 years old, they don't call me and all that. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's business. They, they have the right to hire who they want. You know, even though there might be discrimination, that's just how it is. They want a younger look. They want to get a younger audience to look because there's young people. So that's just a business, you know, so it's all good. At least I got in when I got in because I was a kid at 24 playing with Aretha and I had done all my jazz stuff with all the legends before that. So I was the youngest kid until Teddy uh, came on Aretha's son he was the youngest guy in the group. When he came on, he was the youngest. But before then, I was the youngest guy in the group, you know, and took that for a ride until the ride, I had to get off the ride, you know, and it's all good. But, you know, one, you know, I had, I stayed on that gig to buy my house, to set up and the whole thing, like I had told you, or I don't know if I told you, now I'm, you know, I'm at the age I am, 67. You know, and I, I'm, God has let me live this long, even though I died twice four years ago in the hospital. So I already knew that when I got to this age that I would be writing repertoire for bass. Mm -hmm. Like some of the pieces I've given you or Dr. K that yep. like, I already knew I was going to do that. So I started doing that. I got Dora Cole. You already know that we talked about that, you know, and, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I already knew that was going to happen. So I'm in a good part of my life because I see some of the young kids that I've mentored. They're going for master degrees. I got one at USC that's going for his doctorate. That's from Oakland that I try to hook you up with, mm -hmm. you know, and he's coming from a, you know, a, a bad situation, you know, and he's all loving school. And I said, this will set you up the rest of your life. So, you know, I see all these kids doing stuff, you know, and um, it's all good because I don't want to do that. And I'm not going to do it, you know? So I sit here doing my thing and writing some new music or whatever, doing stuff with Momo, our Com Brandino Momo comedy show, yeah, which that. has become a whole nother scenario, you know, besides me working on some more uh, original songs or whatever pieces, you know, doing that, you know, and I was telling somebody that, you know, I'm playing some of my old Fenders because I've been, I'm a war in Dorsey for years, but when I got sick, I had uh, my my uh, electric bass luthier, if you want to call it that. You know, Greg Coates, they used to work at World of Strings with Ralphie back in the day. I had him going through all my closets and redoing all my old instruments and make sure they work. So when I started the, uh, the band with uh, Robbie, the new experience, you know, I said, let me go old school. And he liked that. So I'm playing just, a, you know, a regular jazz bass from the 60s. It's got that sound, you know, and it just, it, it works. 
I'm not trying to play R&B. You know, I'm just trying to stay in that rock thing, you know, and that way, basically, he's got six string, I got four strings. You know, and it makes you think a different way playing lines. Yeah. But I ain't trying to play booty bass. You know, not on that. So, you know, <laughs> uh, things are going real good from that aspect. You know, and, you know, I'm a new father because I got a new six and a half month old uh, boxer, Belgian, Belgian, Belgian Malawa pit mix puppy. That's a handful. Where's Roscoe at? I don't know where Roscoe is. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, you talk about dealing with something new. Yeah. That's a whole nother thing. He's six and a half months and he's 50 pounds. Yeah, that's a serious, serious project right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My sister, she took him out last week during the birthday week. And she came back and said, what's up? Well, man, you know, he likes to sniff it. He's a puppy. He ain't a puppy. He's a damn dog, <laughs> you know, because he's 50 pounds. And he look at this say, you know, he's all, he still falls over the place on all that because he's a puppy, you know, but he's a big puppy. Yeah. <laughs> every time I walk in with, with Billy, they go, he's a puppy. He's as big as the dog. I said, she's nine years old. He's six and a half months. She goes, what? He's a puppy? I said, he's a puppy. He don't look like a puppy to me. So that's my, 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 my uh, that's been my new fatherhood, um, whatever you want to call it, duty or whatever, you know. So it's just, you know, yeah, he definitely has some life around here, believe me. Oh, I'll bet. You got I one. You got a puppy, so you already know what I'm saying. Yeah, but I can only imagine my dog's 12 pounds. I think he's enough of a handful. And, and, and if he's a puppy at 50 pounds, that's my my brother has a dog that's about 80 pounds, this big pit bull mix. And if that dog makes a decision, look out, you know. <laughs> well, Roscoe's going to get there. They're telling me he's going to hit 80 to 90 pounds. Yeah. Wow. You know, and it's all good. He's a sweetheart. I mean, he's like a little man. I'm serious. It's, it's so funny compared to my, my other dog, Louie, that passed away because Louie was a fright. I bring him in a dog park. He's going to sing a lot of dog, and that's it. He's off and running, man. I'm telling you. I've had to pull him off so many dogs. You know, he just he was just a force to reckon with, seriously. Wow. You know, so it's kind of a change in my older ears that I have, you know, <laughs> older years that I have a dog that's a little bit more attained. But we'll see how that goes. Because he's got a boxer, pit, and Belgian Malawal mix. So we'll see what side of the brain that he really fully develops. Yeah. It could be, could, could be, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see for sure. Wow. Exactly. I'm telling <laughs> within a year and a half, I'll know what I got. So anyway, back to the base thing. That's kind of what's up. Uh, anything else, um, uh, um, Jason, that you want to talk about or delve? Well, I, 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 yeah, I mean, there's so many things I want to. It, it's funny because I feel I think we've talked every couple of weeks for the last few years, you know, more or less, maybe a, maybe more than a few weeks every. But like, you know, you ha I, so I should thank you for a bunch of things. Thank you for introducing me to Dorico. You hipped me to Dorico, and I remember talking like a few months ago with you about because I had been using Finale for a long time. I was playing around with Sibelius. And then I started experimenting with Dorico, and I, I use that thing every week for projects. Yeah. And that's yeah. that, that's an incredible that's an incredible app. So thank you for that. That has been a real Oh, yeah. No, well, you know what it is is that Daniel, I forgot his last name, uh, that originally was with Sibelius when Sibelius was owned by Avid mm -hmm. and all that. He was the one that was writing the code. So he had told me at the last NAMM show I saw, and before uh, – so Bell, you know, before Avid cleared house up there, up there by you with all the Sibelius team, he had told me, wait a couple of years because I'm going to make a program that's going to have the best of finale, finale and Sibelius in. So finally it became available. And that XML format, I have one of the kids, uh, John, you know, John. Yep. The, the, the prodigy kid. He was sending me everything in Sibelius because I think that's what they use at USC. So when I asked him for an XML, he goes, oh, you're using Dorico. I said, yeah. I like the program better. I like how it's laid out easier. And it seems like I can do more faster and easier than going through 
because uh, when it went from Sibelius 5 to 7, the whole front end just got real cluttered. I mean, you had to go down two or three levels, and it was like, oh, man, I, you know, yeah. I'm not trying to go through, you know, I'm not trying to go through a, a calculus test here, seriously. So it made it a lot easier for that, you know. So I had John transcribe so, some of those things that I had sent you. I love those. All those so and that you know, just think, thinking about the breadth of your like all the the that you've done in your career. You know, like these burning solos that you were sending me of of uh, the transcriptions that John was doing. It's it's wild. It's like uh, eight. You know, if you think of it just as like an etude to work on or a solo to work on, it's like it's it's wild. You know what what was coming out of your brain on those on those dates? Hey man, all I know is I was young and and some of that stuff I got didn't even know. 40 years ago, they had taped it, and V and, and I had told uh, Jeff, um, forgot his last, Donnelly, I think that's the last name, Jeff, I told him that in this day and age, he could never sync it back in the old days, but I said they can sync anything. So he found a production house, wherever he lived, that was able to, they matched it, you know, that we put up, and, and I scared myself looking at it looking at the thumb position and trying to do that and up and down the neck and all that. And one of the pieces John really liked, you saw, oh, man, you gave me, you know, cause he's got perfect pitch and plays piano or bass. It doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. And his sister's a violinist. Oh, it's like one of those things I go, you know, it's one of those kind, you know, one of those brainy kids, you know, the real sweetheart. And he says, Hey man, Kev, you gave me a runner for my money. I said, good. That's good. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's another thing. I don't know if you have time. Sure. Yeah. I, I wanted to call, do a Zoom with me, you, and Harvey, Professor Harvey. I that love you that. Had talked about. Yeah. I talked to him. I told him I'm, I'm, we were going to do it at 11. I said I had to postpone. I said, I'm going to give you a call. He said, I'll be around. So I wanted to do that not only because he was the second guy that bought a five string from Eastman. Mm -hmm. And he got a real uh, Jermaine. Paul has it now, his student, which is coming up. He's at Northridge and, you know, he's he's on fire and all that. But his base, he, from all the bases, he's got the biggest one. But he told me he took that in the orchestra here in town. And the conductor says, you need to find me three or four other bass players that have a five string that sounds like you because that bass alone took over the section. Oh, wow. Whoever the section leader was, he was in the dust because that bass is that powerful. Oh, and Jermaine, cool. Jermaine got in a car accident and messed it up. It's at Lisa's. He don't have the money to fix it. But I talked to him about that. I said, don't ever sell that bass because you ain't going to find another one like that. I'm telling you. Because they come and go like that. You know how manufacturers are. Oh, yeah. Some year they have a good run. Some years they're okay and all that. Plus, it's 10 years old now. So it's got some age on it. The way that a five-string works mechanically mm -hmm. and physically, how it's built, and the idiosyncrasies of, of each instrument, because it's different. Yeah. You know, well, there, there's no consistency. Brand or manufacturers or countries that it come from, usually it's always going to be bigger then a four string, obviously, no matter if it's three quarter or a, a seven eighths or full size bass, they're gonna make the, they're gonna make the the mechanics of the instrument different to handle that low B. You bet. Yeah, exactly. Obviously. Yeah. So you know that's kind of what's up with that. You know, so I don't know if there's anything else. Well, you know, one thing that you reminded me of talking about your cello bass, and this came up a couple weeks ago on a on an Eastman call. Is that cello bass? That's technically like a five eighths bass, right? You would call it. Yeah, John said he thought somebody screwed up <laughs> in the factory in Shanghai, right? I That's think, where Eastman is, right? Uh, in, in, in Beijing, but but Beijing, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, Beijing, yeah. Shanghai, Beijing. I know I get confused, but anyway, he said. I think somebody screwed up over there, Kev. And because he was saying the neck was real thick, he wanted to shave it down. I said, don't. Leave it the way it is. You mess with anything, it'll change the sound. Well, you're going to get tired. I said, well, the neck is smaller than my my big 
Justin Timberlake, seven eighths Eastman bass I have. Believe me, that's like playing nothing compared to that bass. <laughs> you know, because that bass has a sound. Oh, yeah. can you hear the bass? Yeah, we can hear it. We'll tone it down. You know, it's that. It does what it does. Yeah. You know, and the thing about it might be a new bass. Who cares? Because I'm not playing classical music that I need to bring the date of receipt that I bought it. And usually on that, you want it to be more clean or brighter because you can hear the notes better. You can always warm it up. Mm -hmm. But basically the articulation, you can hear it. You know, I mean, on movie days, it's like muffled. It's like having a mute on your baby. You know, they don't want that. They got to hear it. That's you know, it. it's interesting. So the cello bass, you had, yeah, it's technically, I wanted a 5 eighths case. Eastman said they didn't supply those because they never get asked for 5 eighths bases. They use a half size for kids, right? Then they mm -hmm. go to three quarters. I'm asking you that because you're an educator. You've Todd University. So it is supposedly technically it's a five eight space. Yeah. Yeah. And, and length. Yeah, because it's not a regular quarter inch, a three quarter inch is 41. Pretty much that was a standard rule. This one I think is 39 or 38. Wow. From the nut to that. Okay. So it can't be wherever they have the bridge set up with the FOs. And the little diamond cuts that they do, obviously, that's where they put the bridge, right? So what I remember measuring, I think it's like 39. Okay, okay. So it's got it's not a three quarters because it doesn't have a string length of, of 41 inches. Well, we, we've been talking about working on a 5 eighths pattern. And, and so it came up a couple weeks ago, like, uh, have we made a 5 eighths base before? And I said, well, I know you made at least one. And and because <laughs> Brandino has one. And then Ralph said, oh, yeah, I know that base. That, that, and so anyway, I, I don't know if any if it was a mistake. It's a good mistake if they did because it's a nice base. Um, you heard it. Yeah, no, it's a great instrument. Yeah. <laughs> you heard it. That low E. Ralph Armstrong, which you hopefully know who he is from Detroit, he thought that was my low five-string bass. I said, no, man, listen to the note. It's an E. It's not a B. But he was impressed because, you know, Ralph, he's a great bass player. Yeah. You know, did Ma Vishna, all that back in the day. But he's an upright bass player. Played mm -hmm. in the Detroit Symphony a long time ago. So he's been classically trained. You know, so he had mentioned that. He said, Kev, that bass sounds great. He thought it was one of my low basses. Yeah. But it wasn't. But you know, I love. I'm about to. I'm trying to clean up my my living room here from me being sick. Slowly but surely, I'm getting stuff taken out of my uh, my living room to take it because I've got a nice wood floor made of oak that's about mm -hmm. 70 years old. So when you play the bass in here, I got a three foot subwoofer all underneath my house crawl space. Oh, nice! It's unbelievable. So that bass, that bass is one of a kind because Professor Harvey tried to get one. And he called, he goes, you can special order it, but we're going to have to get Brandino's bass back. We don't, we don't have a pattern on it. So you're telling me they're asking about a pattern, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I but it, it, came, it just came up and I thought that was, I thought that was hilarious. So yeah, because well, I think more people want to play five eights these days. It, it's, it's, there's more demand for them from what I understand. Well, you know what? It didn't originally when I got a bass, it had a low B on it. So my engineer, Big Mike, Mike Gunnarsson, that I've had for years, he comes over, he's the engineer. And he goes, Kev, I'm hearing the third octave on the B. There's no fundamental. He says, it's too small of a body. I go, well, yeah, I know. I'm just getting from engineer. I know what I know, but you know what you know. Listen to it. Because he always goes here and listens to my bass. He goes, man, there's no fundamental. So when I put an E on it, there's a fundamental. Mm -hmm. So I said... I always I wanted to make this a cello bass because I wanted it that size. I wanted to have that high C that you didn't have to go all the way up, constipated in these, you know, mm -hmm. up there at the top of the fingerboard, because you know it ain't gonna speak because bass ain't built like that. It's built to play bass notes. But with that cello bass, it's one of a kind. It's a beautiful instrument. And every time I hear that little demo I was doing while I was warming up. From that, from the robot. Yeah. It sounds, I couldn't believe how it sounded and how it projected. 
Thanks for chatting, Brandino. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn more, check out the links below. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.